we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Kaylee Pruitt-Ham and David Ayala. Kaylee Pruitt-Ham and David Ayala are both with the Seattle chapter of CISPUS, the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. Kaylee and David, thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you. Our pleasure. So let's start out. Tell us uh, about CISPUS and how you both got involved. Um, well, uh, I obviously um, don't have as rich of a history with CISPUS, but um, I am currently the coordinator of the Seattle chapter, and I've been here for a couple of months with Seattle CISPUS as the coordinator. Um, before that, I was serving as a phone banker fundraiser um, for CISPUS, and it really was a wonderful way to get involved with the organization because they really um, accept and honor your analysis and um, honor that you develop that. Um, but before that, I got involved with El Salvador by going on a delegation when I was 17 in 2007. And that was during a time when um, people were protesting the privatization of water. So um, I can talk a little bit about that later, but that's definitely come full circle as we're heading into some events that are fighting against privatization in El Salvador. Mm. Well, I am a Salvadorian, and uh, you can recognize by my accent. And um, I came here in 1990. I came um, to, I was really active during the Civil War in El Salvador. I was a union leader, and I was arrested. And after the second mayor, FMLN offensive, and um, I was tortured and disappeared. And thankful to the help of the solidarity of CISPES and other organizations um, around the globe, I was kept alive. And I came to United States. I was so messed up in my head. I may be still a little bit, but mm -hmm. at that time I was really messed up. And I came to spend some time with some friends and. Uh, it was a hard decision. I stay in the country. And um, I knew about CISPES in El Salvador for the solidarity that they gave. And um, I, after that, I started kind of participating, being active with the chapter in Seattle. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the, the Civil War came about and what the U.S. role in that was? Yeah. Um, it's kind of a painful story, uh, painful and I would say like an amazing story at the same time. Amazing because kind of uh, uh, people felt uh, tired of being exploited, of being uh, taken advantage of. Uh, political spaces were small and those who uh, protest against injustice in the country were killed, assassinated, and uh, so people rebelled and it's not something that they wanted to go to war, that we wanted to go to war. It's not about that. It's like the only escape to change what was going on in the country. Two elections happened before the, the, uh, the war started and both elections were uh, well known that they were um, taken away from the party who won the elections at that time and were parties uh, immensely supported by the people. So after elections were taken away from people and, and uh, the injustice was more brutal in the country, um, people start little by little uh, making more radical actions at the point that uh, some decide to fight and the war started. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, whatever point of view you have it, uh, Central America, not only El Salvador, but Central America, uh, Nicaragua Revolution happened in 79, uh, Guatemala, there was an increased movement uh, of uh, forces against the government, and uh, United States uh, thought now, the government of the United States and those who have the power in this country saw that as a threat. And uh, they start kind of investing enormously 
in stopping the war. So there is some data that say that the United States invested 1.5 million per day in the war in the country, which that means that a lot of armed supplies and uh, logistical to the army. And, uh, and so it was hard. And uh, it's, 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 I can see like uh, it, it is called a low intensity war. It's the same tactics and techniques that they use in Vietnam. And, and when I, after that experience, and, and, and I see society in the United States now, is I see that some low intensity war techniques are being applied now here in the United States, you know. And, and that's kind of, it's kind of interesting to see that situation because like, uh, um, for instance, in El Salvador, you have the feeling that you are being watched all the time, yeah. And, and now in the United States, you have the same feeling that you're being watched. Um, so, it was hard, I think, uh, um, and it was in, incredibly important, the, the aid that the United States gave to the country. Uh, several, uh, when the war started, the army was 10,000 folks. But after the war, at, at the end of the war, there was almost 100,000 army soldiers and, uh, fighting 8,000, 9,000 guerrilla members at that time. And you mentioned uh, U.S. giving logistics. My understanding is is that um, U.S. Uh, quote unquote advisors were present during things like torture. That uh, there's numerous accounts of people who were being tortured that um, heard and or saw U.S. advisors during that process. Yeah, it's it's kind of a good point. It was like uh, United States tried to portray themselves that they were just giving the logistical support to the war, but uh, they had advisors. And in several occasions, there is cases where advisors actually participated in the war. And I mean, fighting, shooting. And, uh, uh, and the other piece is about uh, the torture. Uh, it's interesting because kind of when, uh, it's, this is really, it's, it's, it's a good point. Because when, when you see what happened in uh, Iraq, in the jail in Abuja, uh, Abuja Bar, or I, I don't remember exactly this, this prison where uh, uh, Iraqis were held, or those who the U.S. government think that are, are terrorists were th- sent to. And when they start talking about that, the, the methods that they used to torture, is the method that they applied to me in El Salvador. It's kind of, I was, when I was looking at the, at the thing that they did there, I was thinking, oh my God, this is the same that they did to me. You know, like, like, uh, like, uh, uh, I remember that at the beginning of the war, it was like, uh, it was the punishment to kill people. But after the United States got involved into the war, and these were more like technical stuff, they, they, I remember that uh, the, th- the three first day, they punish you physically. The government has the right to keep you away from everybody for 15 days. So then they have a cushion. Yeah, the three first day, there was some physical evidence that you have been physically damaged. But after the three days, they stopped doing that. And all that damage was more psychologically and uh, physically, but without leaving a, a scar. So it was more like a, not giving you food, not giving you water, not letting you sleep, making you do uh, a lot of exercise that make you really tired. So depleting you from energy. And, and then you get to the point that you don't know if this is true or it's not true. That so standing up in front of a wall for all the time, uh, giving you different uh, uh, times of talking to somebody or leaving you alone that you feel that you have been forgotten about. So it's, it's incredible, this piece. Like there is a lot of similarities of the techniques between that oppression and what happened in the country. And in fact, I believe it came out in uh, U.S. Uh, coverage and documents of what uh, the U.S. was doing in Iraq. They actually called what they're doing the Salvadoran option. 
It's true. Yes, uh, uh, I think the uh, the vice president during the Bush, he mentioned that stuff. Cheney. Uh, Cheney, I think that he mentioned that stuff. So, and um, in addition to having to fight um, to st struggle against the the army that the U.S. was supporting then, uh, you also had to deal with paramilitaries then too. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, and this is the other piece. Yeah, like, uh, and this is what I see, for instance, here in in, in the country now. Yeah, like twenty four hours, for instance, that episode that that show in TV, like, uh, is preparing folks to think that it's okay to torture. Yeah, and then uh, and then you have this kind of uh, ideological battle in society where some people think that torture is not good, and other people think that torture is good. So then in El Salvador, the same happened, yeah, that you have uh, to convince, and this is part of United States strategy, yeah, that convince people that it's, it's, it's okay to discuss issues and to have your ideological perspective that it's okay to torture. that, And then you, you build this uh, uh, secret paramilitary groups in, in public paramilitary groups. And then you have, like, at that time, they call it Orden. It was a group of uh, local folks who were, like, uh, defending against the guerrilla movement, their, their cities or their land. And then you have the um, death squads, yeah, who they were kind of not public, they were secret, who kind of kill and arrest and disappear people. And, uh, and 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 that was really painful. Yeah, that was really a scary. That was a scary. That's people run away and, and people. But that's the sad part. But that, but the other amazing part that I was talking about the war is that even though that happened, there was hope. Even though that happened, there were f people who were still fighting back. And 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 that's something that is kind of it's. I think the most beautiful experience in my life you know to see that that the hope in the middle of ashes and things being burned but there is still hope and there's people who were fighting back who were organizing who were kind of uh, uh resisting at one point yeah and doing it intelligently right now is not the time to expand it's a time to survive i remember that, that, that we have this uh um uh, saying or, or uh, soundbite, if you want to call it, yeah, like uh, let's survive right now, let's survive, let's keep together, yeah, and uh, and, and 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 I think that uh, that's incredible. So, in with memories of the, uh, of that of the uh, the good that came out of that and how inspiring it was to see people uh, rise up against such oppression, you must. Um, roll your eyes a bit when you hear uh, people here in the U.S., citizens here in the U.S. saying, oh, things are getting so bad. I'm, it's getting so bad. I feel like I need to leave this country. That must... that's, that's the right thing. Like, that's, that's the right thing. When, when I heard, and I remember I started hearing that stuff when I came, and I think it was when uh, George Bush won the elections. And I heard people say, oh, I should go to Canada. I should da -da -da. And then I say, I, I say to people that I heard that stuff, I say, why you don't stay and fight? I mean, I mean, if everybody leave, I mean, who is going to fight back? Yeah, and and so that was one thing. That the other piece that is kind of and and it was going on. Yeah, we want to move to the big cities, and then and that's why the middle is so uh, the middle of the country is so kind of uh, right wind. Yeah, at this moment because all the good folks are moving out to the big cities where it's more democracy, more kind of openness to new ideas. But did you see, and that's the beauty about the immigrant movement right now, because we are moving, immigrants are moving to those places. And then it's interesting, I'm sorry, I'm, get, I, I'm getting off the topic, but it's interesting like uh, uh, Martin Luther King Day, yeah, on the 21st, because kind of blacks and immigrants are coming together. And are coming together because Montgomery, for me, is so beautiful and, and, and give me this hope. 
because Montgomery, Alabama right now is where the civil movements have a big uprising, yeah? And now Montgomery, Alabama, Alabama is the state where they have made the more strict laws against uh, undocumented immigrants. And uh, we have been able to put together demonstrations together between blacks and, and, and immigrants, especially Hispanics, yeah? And if you see it, like for instance, the elections of President Obama in this country was giving a lot of credit to Hispanic immigrants, in particular Hispanics, and Hispanics and blacks don't get along. And, and then Hispanics elected a black president in this country. So for me, it has a lot of significance in, the, in the, how this is moving together and, and how the fight is going on. So uh, there's still many other ties, but one last tie to, to bring us up to date. Um, the, uh, talking about the death squads, uh, one of the, the key leaders in the death squads uh, during the Civil War was uh, Roberto Dabusan, who I believe was one of the founders of ARENA, which now plays a key role in uh, working with the U.S. to try and bring about privatization within El Salvador. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah, definitely. It's been a long journey for El Salvador, and CISPIS has, um, since 1980, uh, which it's a national organization, but we're the uh, Seattle chapter, um, stood alongside the social movement that has been fighting back and has taken a stand with the FMLN, the leftist party, and has done things to fight alongside as partners Um uh, kind of in that the Arena Party, which is connected to the Death Squads and which is the right wing organization in El Salvador, um, has still been able to maintain some power. But in 2009, um, we were able to, along with other um, social movements, uh, have a huge push um, against the U.S. government, which was trying to still interfere in the elections in El Salvador after the war. Um, and so we were able to have a huge campaign four days before um, elections in 2009 in El Salvador um, that pressured the State Department to issue a statement of neutrality saying, okay, we will not interfere in elections and we will um, support whoever wins. And that we actually um, succeeded in that the State Department of the United States issued a statement of neutrality and people went around running around posting that statement doors in El Salvador on people's homes and that broke the atmosphere of fear um, that had been so prevalent for so long where people who would want to vote for an alternative in El Salvador um, would not be able to because they were being threatened by not only the right wing and the right wing owned media in El Salvador, but also senators in 2004 from the U.S. and Congress people who were saying that if you don't vote for the right wing party or the elite or the status quo or the 16 wealthy families um, that will be cooperative with transnational companies and the U.S., uh, military economic agenda, then we will deport your families because a, a third of Salvadorans live in the United States as immigrants and send money back to El Salvador um, because of poverty that is occurring, which is, I believe, the root cause of immigration um, in many ways. And the root cause of poverty is a lot of our trade agreements that the United States pushes um, and that transnational corporations push. And so um, CISPIS is trying to um, remain an active partner in not only seeing that, oh, the, the, the major easy-to-see violence is over in the war, um, but we're going to remain uh, true to our mission of standing in solidarity, and we're going to keep on pushing at the root causes of the conflict and the inequity. And so the privatization law that is being pushed by the U.S. and the right wing in El Salvador um, seeks to privatize public sectors such as sea and airports and um, electricity. And um, I mentioned water earlier was one of the um, 
sectors that they were able to, through protests, um, fend off the, the complete privatization of water, although it's a huge problem where just, you know, transnational corporations are trying to, you know, triple the prices of water but, and, and not putting in treatment plants in lakes so that people can have potable water that they don't have to pay so much for to just get water for two days. And, um, and that's what I really learned when I was in El Salvador. I was wondering, you know, why, why would privatization be such a bad thing? Because sometimes the government doesn't do everything perfectly. But I learned that, you know, inherently in the government, particularly this new government, the, <laughs> the more progressive government that is actually impl- you know, moving towards universal health care and wonderful education programs in El Salvador, um, inherent in a government's statement of purpose, I guess, would be for the good of all people, but inherent in corporations and transnational corporations' um, mission is the profit of a few, not the profit of the many. Um, so just going by that rule alone, we're very, very suspicious of um, what privatization would mean for El Salvador's public sectors. So we are, um, and it has meant in the past um under the ARENA administrations from 1989 to 2009, the state sold off assets um, under ARENA valued at over $5.7 billion, but it received only $334 million. And so it really doesn't um, benefit any Salvadorans. And in general, it allows people to, you know, break up unions and not treat workers well, not... Uh, heed environmental or human rights um, proper practices. And um, that's happening in the U.S. too. And so that's why we're bringing a speaker from El Salvador, um, Alex Gomez Rodriguez, who is the treasurer of the Federation of Public Service Workers in El Salvador. And the purpose of this labor solidarity speaking tour um, there's another speaker who's touring the East Coast of the United States, but he's touring the West Coast. And while he's in Seattle, he's going to be meeting with unions and um, labor organizations and um, and just the general public here in Seattle to say, hey, when workers unite, then we can really, really hold corporations and um, our governments accountable um, when we try to catch these decisions that are going to be made behind closed doors. In this public privatization law, pr- public-private partnership law, it's really a privatization law. Um, it has a provision that would create an executive body that would um, surpass any need to go through the legislative assembly. So once this would be passed through the legislative assembly, which it's set to be vote on in El Salvador very soon, um, then for possibly 40 years ahead, it wouldn't be a decision that the public would have any say in, which we barely do in the first place. So this is the time, um, the Labor Solidarity Tour coming up, actually starting tonight, Alex is flying into the airport and we're making a statement of solidarity with airport workers at SeaTac who are um, also facing issues because they're subcontracted and a huge, horrible mistreatment of workers and, and underpay um, they're under poverty wages. And so right away, right as Alex gets off the plane, we're going to have um, a statement um, trading solidarity between um, airport workers in El Salvador and airport workers at SeaTac. And then um, we have a bunch of events coming up on, on Monday that I can I can talk about because everybody is invited to um, an action in front of the World Trade Center offices um, on Monday, February 4th. Uh, we're going to be walking from the Labor Temple after our Labor Leaders Lunch meeting, with, which is open to people who are involved with labor and union organizations and uh, trade justice organizations. And then we're walking um, at 1.30. We will be holding a speak out and a couple members, representatives of the unions will be speaking out against um, the privatization law and speaking about their own struggles, uh, like SPIA, the um, engineers union, who's um, going to talk about their own struggles and how how it's a common theme, and we can connect the dots. I think that that's really what CISPIS and Seattle CISPIS um, 
is evolving into is that we have amazing lessons to learn from El Salvador, that it's not just about this tiny country, that if you happen to have a fancy, like fancy this small country and you want to be involved, then maybe you can have this be like a peripheral organization that you support. No, this is a root cause organization that is making global ties and El Salvador was able to defeat privatization of the healthcare system in, in 2002, 2003, with nurses and doctors striking. They have an amazing social movement history that is rearing to go. And it's a really great partnership to have solidarity organizations working, too. And I understand one of the things that they're pushing to privatize there, as they are here in the U.S., is uh, education, higher education. Yes. Yeah. That's another thing that is on the chopping block. And um, that really relates to what's going on the in the U.S. as well, where um, uh, also in higher education, definitely we have problems with the Board of Regents at University of Washington um, and a lot of a lot of different struggles, but also with public schools and secondary secondary education that um, we just passed the, the charter school <laughs> uh, law that is going to enable people to privatize education um, in a way that really any any area where corporations um, see that, hey, that's a service that's really essential that people just have to have. Why don't we make money off of it? That's That's what's happening. And we have to point that out and we have to take a stand and say, yeah, even if like what best case scenario people get some people get rich off of it in the end no one will be well off because we're ruining our earth and we're ruining our own people and we're creating instability it's not a security advantage to be causing horrible turmoil um, in El Salvador that of course there are going to be people fighting back and, and causing turmoil in the country so that people have to immigrate. All right. So we only have a, just about a minute left. So, uh, again, you've got uh, multiple events happening uh, starting today. You've got the uh, Alex Gomez Rodriguez is coming in C- to SeaTac, and we'll be uh, making a, a statement. Right. We're, we're greeting him. It mm-hmm. is, is not technically a demonstration. Okay. Um, but, yeah, on Monday, February 4th, definitely we have a lot of events Um and after the speak out at 1.30 at the mm-hmm. World Trade Center offices, which is around 2200 Alaskan Way, then from 6 to 8 p.m., we'll, uh, Alex will be presenting at Seattle University. And All right. And that'll be at the uh, STCN Student Center? Yes. <laughs> okay. You have trouble finding it, looking um, looking that up, or you can look at seattlesuspice.org for more information. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, I want to thank you both very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.